Welcome to this uh, first uh, webinar on uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 on uh, surgical education, taking a new approach uh, for changing time. I'm Professor Bijendra Patel, and uh, I'll be hosting this uh, webinar. So uh, briefly about me, I'm uh, a clinical academic surgeon based at uh, Barnes and uh, Royal London Hospital and Queen Mary University of London. Uh, and I'm passionate about surgical education and globalization of uh, 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 surgical skills uh, using technology enhanced learning platform. Let me tell you a bit about this uh, event. We'll be discussing impact of uh, COVID-19 on surgical education and uh, also conducting a global uh, laparoscopic surgery masterclass for uh, uh, hands-on uh, training online. Digital health is disrupting healthcare and education. As a college or a university or a training provider working on digital education, how can you engage in this world for providing technical and non technical skills training remotely? Our agenda will um, start with a presentation on. Uh, uh, biliary anatomy, as this is a cholecystectomy masterclass, uh, we will first talk about biliary anatomy and management of gallstone disease. Followed by this, uh, I'll show you uh, a video on uh, how uh, to do a safe uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Uh, and then there'll be a panel discussion on uh, a second video that I'll present uh, step by step, having broken down the operation into small bits, learning uh, different aspects of the operation as we go from access to uh, completion of the procedure. And finally, we'll have uh, the last half an hour dedicated to uh, online uh, hands on uh, uh, skills training. And today we'll be focusing on acquiring uh, uh, skills for uh, making an endo loop which we use in our uh, routine uh, practice for appendicectomy. Uh, endo loop is made using extracorporeal rotors, not tying technique, which is what I'm going to teach you online today. Our uh, first panelist is uh, Professor Shafi Ahmed, who needs a little or no introduction. He's a multi-award winning cancer surgeon working with me at Royal London Hospital. And in 2015, he has been uh, given the accolade of the world's most watched surgeon as he streamed live operation using Google Glasses, virtual reality, social media, and on national television, uh, operative live, which was uh, shortlisted for a BAFTA award in 2019. He has set up surgical education program in over 20 countries, including conflict zone. Our second panelist is again uh, an award-winning surgeon, Professor Tan Arunapalam. He's a consultant surgeon committed to teaching. He's based in Colchester, London, with special interest in colorectal surgery. He runs uh, numerous laparoscopic surgical courses uh, and master's program in minimal invasive surgery and robotic surgery. He's on the research committee of the European Association of Endoscopic Surgeon and a council member of ALS GBR, which is Association of Laparoscopic Surgeon of Great Britain and Ireland. And finally, uh, I have uh, Lillian Reza. She used to be my registrar. Now she's a, uh, a nearly qualified uh, consultant surgeon. She's a ST7, a high surgical trainee in the Northeast uh, Thames London Deanery. Uh, has completed her undergraduate studies from Barts in the Royal London and uh, gained her master's degree in surgical science from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Lillian is currently undertaking a period of uh, out of program research towards the end of her training at St. Mark's uh, Hospital. Uh, so uh, over to you, Lillian, now on uh, anatomy and management of uh, gallstones. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Here I am. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about applied anatomy pathology and guidelines for management of gallstone disease. Now, essentially, um, when we talk about performing a cholecystectomy laparoscopically, we have to be very uh, con considered about the anatomy in the area um, because the typical anatomy that we learn about is present only in 50% of the population. 
atypical anatomy is found in a large group of the people out there that we operate on and most commonly they arise from the bile duct to the vascular system and the atypical anatomy can be further compounded by inflammation and fibrosis as a result of recurrent cholecystitis and therefore it becomes even more important to be wary of what we're operating on um, to avoid injuring the CBD and the surrounding structures. Now to start with, uh, typical gallbladder anatomy is something that we should, be, we should probably all know very well by now, but I'm just going to go through it quickly. The gallbladder is found uh, between the fourth and fifth segments of the liver in the inferior border of the liver. And it is essentially uh, attached to the common hepatic duct via the cystic duct. Uh, which uh, 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 then becomes the common bile duct. The, it, uh, the arterial system is mainly from the cystic artery and most commonly it arises from the right hepatic artery, which joins onto the hepatic artery proper and the celiac axis. And this is sort of the anatomy that we're all uh, familiar with. Now you can see the, the triangle, which is bordered with the blue dots. I just want to focus uh, quite briefly on this triangle. Um, so this is the hepatocystic triangle and essentially um, the borders are the inferior margin of the liver, the cystic duct and medially the common hepatic duct. When we're dissecting out the gallbladder and dissecting out the two main structures, the cystic duct and the cystic artery, this is sort of the um, imaginary uh, landmark or anatomy that we are looking for. And the main reason we want to do that is because we want to identify the cystic artery in this area. Now, the hepatocystic triangle is uh, something that's uh, quite relevant to laparoscopic cholecystectomy. When I was um, reading about uh, anatomy as a medical student, I, I've, I came across two triangles and often this used to confuse me. Kayla's triangle is the traditional landmark for biliary anatomy. And I don't think it's any longer really relevant and should be discussed, but just for, for perspective, we we know about it, but really what we should concentrate on is the hepatocystic triangle because this is uh, the, these are the landmarks within which we will find the cystic artery um, and often associated with the lymph node known as the lymph node of Lund um, and the right hepatic artery posteriorly. So um, what, when performing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, in a large group of patients, you might be able to identify Ruvia sulcus, which is a sulcus in the right side of the liver. And this is a very important sulcus because it is at the same plane as the CBD. And the idea is to, to keep your dissection above this sulcus um, when uh, looking to dissect out the, the cystic artery and the cystic duct. Below the sulcus, there's a high risk of injuring the CBD. So if you look at image B, uh, the operator has identified the cystic duct and where he thinks or he, she thinks the cystic artery might be associated with a tented CBD right here. And they've gone on to uh, dissect out these structures. And you can see here the connective tissue has been dissected out. And uh, you can see the cystic duct and the cystic artery two structures arising from the gallbladder. And this is sort of the, the, the configuration that you want to have at the, at, just before you clip any of these structures. Moving on to anatomical variations, um, there, there are numerous variations that are possible in this area. The, they can be classified into arterial, biliary, gallbladder, and CBD. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the arterial and biliary tree simply because there are the most common variations and hence most relevant um, for this talk. Arterial variations can arise from a replaced hepatic artery, an accessory artery, or from variations of the cystic artery. Um, a replaced hepatic artery is essentially an, an artery that is, that is not originating from where we would expect it, to, expect it to. So you could have a right hepatic artery, a left hepatic artery, not originating from the hepatic artery proper, but coming from anywhere else around the celiac axis or even the SMA. And the accessory artery is just an extra artery in addition to what your typical uh, vascular anatomy would be. Now, um, just for some engagement, I've, I've asked a question here. What is the uh, common, commonest arterial variation found within the hepatic arterial system? Um, if anyone would like to answer, um, you could do so in the, in the Q&A section, actually. Um, I can see if. Okay. In the interest of time, Lillian, you better carry on. Yeah. 
So um, this was asked in my uh, FRCS, so uh, which is why I've put it in. Uh, it's the thing. It's not. So the answer is the replaced right hepatic artery. Um, so just moving along with this, so you can see from this figure, there are lots of numerous possibilities in terms of uh, variations in the, uh, the vascular system, but the most commonest are the replaced right hepatic artery taking origin from the superior mesenteric artery, or the, um, the replaced left hepatic artery taking its origin from the left gastric artery. Now, if you um, think about the cystic artery, there are, again, multiple variations possible. The most common one is uh, uh, image A, but you can have a cystic artery that arises anterior um, to the common hepatic artery from the left hepatic artery, anterior to the uh, common hepatic duct from the left hepatic artery, or from the gastrojunal artery of, uh, again, in various configurations, just, again, anteriorly to the common hepatic duct, or just as a short structure um, that can be quite difficult to clip, or as a dual structure which needs to be clipped. So biliary tree variations, um, the most relevant one I think is the right posterior hepatic duct that um, we need to be aware of. Essentially, the, the right hepatic uh, duct arises from the anterior and posterior branch, which are sectorial ducts. But if you've got um, a variation where the right posterior hepatic duct joins onto the common hepatic duct, then there is a very good chance that you might mistake it for the cystic duct and end up injuring it or clipping that duct. So it's, it's good to be aware of this variation. Um, there are again numerous accessory hepatic ducts that um, you might come across and it's very important to know that they, they are um, a possibility because if you don't clip them or dissect them out properly or injure them, you could lead to a bile leak. The commonest one I suspect in, in um, practice would be the ducts of Lushka or the accessory ducts that rise from the cystic plate. And these ones are often missed, but they should really be clipped to avoid um, a bile leak. Now, uh, in terms of cystic duct variations, they can, they, it's good to be aware of them because they can cause a lot of technical, uh, in terms of di technical difficulty in uh, identifying the cystic duct. So if you have a the cystic duct that joins quite low uh, to the common hepatic duct, then um, there's a risk of injuring the CBD. A uh, cystic duct that's adherent to the common hepatic duct needs, needs to be identified in, uh, in a, a proper way to avoid injuring the common hepatic duct. And again, you can have a short cystic duct or one that spirals right in front of the common hepatic duct or posteriorly. And these are just some of the variations that could be found. Um, so moving on to the management of gallstone disease, the short and sweet answer to asymptomatic patients with uh, biliary stones found on CT or ultrasound scan is that they, they, they don't require any treatment because the risks of cholecystectomy far outweigh um, the benefits in an asymptomatic patient. Um, symptomatic cholelithiasis, we are all aware of, biliary colic, cholecystitis, obstructive jaundice and pancreatitis. These patients should all really have a cholecystectomy. Um, and the NICE guidance, which was published in 2014, uh, suggests that patients with very colic and cholecystitis should have cholecystectomy, but those with acute cholecystitis should be offered an early cholecystectomy, usually as a day case and if, and if appropriate, laparoscopic procedure. Now, CBD stones, they're quite common. Um, bile duct clearance and laparoscopic cholecystectomy essentially should be offered for any patient with a CBD stone, whether or not they're symptomatic. And bile duct clearance could be offered as, a, as an ERCP, or if you have the appropriate skills, then um, you could offer an intraoperative clearance. Um, so this is my final slide. These are just recommendations for gallstone pancreatitis. About even until five years ago, there was some inconsistency in the international guidance of when we should be performing a cholecystectomy. Um, but in 2016, NICE has recommended that laparoscopic cholecystectomy should be offered in the same admission for anyone with mild pancreatitis. But in severe pancreatitis, they could be delayed if that's clinically appropriate. And the International Association of Pancreatology has uh, also published very similar guidance with regards to this, this either cholecystectomy at the index admission or within six weeks of uh, severe pancreatitis. So essentially, this was just a brief uh, introduction to the, the uh, the concerns that aberrant anatomy can bring about um, and also the, the indications for surgery in these patients. Lillian, thank you very much. We'll take, we've got some questions um, 
uh, that we'll take now. Um, welcome, Tan. And uh, Shafi, so Tan, uh, Professor Tan uh, and Professor Shafi Amal, who are on our panel now, will uh, go through a uh, few questions that uh, our uh, attendees have asked. So the first one was, uh, how do you look at the trainee's posture and instrument grip handling? Uh, as this is an important um, uh, aspect in lab training. So I take it this is with regards to the MSc and uh, remote uh, training uh, that you are referring to. So in terms of trainees posture and grip, um, when we share the screen, I can see the trainee. So uh, you have two camera. One is the camera which is attached to your box trainer and the second camera is your laptop webcam. So we can see the uh, uh, trainee as well as what's inside the box trainer, how they are standing, how they're holding instruments, etc. So I hope that answers your question. Um, now the next question, maybe I, uh, I'll throw it to the panel. What are your thoughts on how trainees can make up the lost training time? Uh, Shafi? Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us in a great um, webinar. Uh, Bijan, well done uh, for organizers. This is the future, isn't it? Online education resources. You've always been a protagonist, I think, about the future of education. So, this is an amazing experience. So, well done, Bijan, and well done for you for turning up. Um, so, look, this is a really difficult question, and a lot of people are asking about this across all specialties. Uh, I was just on a seminar now with a whole of experts uh, around COVID and training not just primary care, but secondary care and surgery in particular. So if you think about it, we have about 50,000 operations per month, electively, uh, in the NHS, uh, across all disciplines. The lab can only make a, a significant part of that. And that's all been cancelled over the last uh, six to eight weeks. A lot of that will now be uh, restored. So there's three phases of the COVID response. One is, of course, uh, restoration of services and then recovery. So I expect a lot of private hospitals will be um, uh, used to maximize their theater capacity for NHS work. So that becomes opportunity for a lot of numbers to be performed quickly to overcome some of the hurdles around training at the moment. Also the NHS itself will give itself up to hopefully fast track some of these cases going forward. So I think the, the training um, kind of um, directors understand this. You'll be, um, you may require less uh, onerous training for the first few, these few months, except with less numbers. I think it's also of us as trainers and trainees to make sure that whatever capacity we have, we use that for your training opportunities, and that includes the private sector. So I just think we've got to be watchful and wait for at the moment as to what happens next. Thanks, Shafi. Uh, next question, uh, I'll let uh, Dan answer that. Uh, should we use the surgical simulation for annual appraisal and revalidation of surgeons? That's Thanks, uh, Bijan, uh, and uh, great to be here with uh, the panel. Um, and thank you all for joining us. So, uh, should simulation form part of uh, the annual appraisal? This is a complicated uh, uh, process, uh, and appraisal and how we um, train our surgeons, how we achieve competence and then mastery is an is an evolution we are in the age of training now you know it, we were in a discovery phase of how to do the surgery we're in an age now of training because we understand some of the surgical treatments so the short answer to your question is surgical simulation is an absolute must um, we have seen the airline industry and several other safety critical industries go through simulation whether it's technical training or simple scenario planning and so I think simulation plays a vital part in this, and it is a, a very important cog. Whether that becomes part of um, how uh, we are revalidated and appraised, uh, that's for the, the policymakers to decide. But I have no doubt in my mind, as litigation rises, as the focus on outcomes in increases, then we have to find a way of standardizing the care that we give. And you know, Shafi has done a lot of work on global surgery. There are 5 billion people who don't have access to safe uh, surgery uh, and anesthesia. And if you're going to train people, you have to have some way of coming back and saying, actually, you received this training 
and that will hopefully help us achieve these outcomes. So the short answer to the question is, I think it will. Uh, how it's done is very critical. It is critical. I mean, uh, I think I just like to add a comment to that. Uh, as of today, it's only in US that uh, simulation-based training uh, is included in their appraisal and revalidation, which is the FLS. Uh, so th there are uh, examples in US, but not worldwide. But if I were to fast forward time and look at five to sort of 15 years ahead, I think the standard practice worldwide would be competency-based training and uh, training and assessment uh, and recertification uh, using uh, all sorts of technology and simulation. Uh, the next question was on, um, uh, has the COVID uh, crisis positively shown us uh, that we can teach, train and deliver surgical care remotely? I think the answer is yes. Uh, uh, you know, th there are examples uh, uh, on uh, remote surgical education and what I have done is simply uh, uh, adopted to some of the existing uh, methods of training and improvised using technology. So it is possible. Um, how long have you started doing laparoscopic surgical procedures and how does it impact on the healthcare staff? Uh, I'm not, I don't quite understand, but I take it, I mean, I've been uh, in uh, clinical practice as a consultant for now uh, over just under 20 years. Uh, and uh, in UK, the surgical training uh, is around 12 years. So it takes 12 years to become a surgeon in UK. So that's the sort of uh, duration of training that we are talking about. Uh, next question was on um, booking online sessions. We have, uh, at the moment, we have a small group. So we communicate uh, in a private uh, WhatsApp group. We don't have an online diary, but we will we'll probably have that for the next academic year. We're setting it up. Um, next question was, in my experience, do you feel remote lab training is as good as face-to-face -face training? Again, talking about uh, self-directed learning, competency-based training, uh, looking at uh, the two models which I presented from US, which is uh, FLS and from UK, from uh, LAPPAS, Association of Laparoscopic Surgeons, these two programs are based for remote training. And then you can have on-site assessment and practice in wherever you are, uh, wherever you are uh, working. You can always, most hospitals or teaching hospitals have a simulation center and lab. And even if you do it remotely unsupervised, you can always find somebody to give you feedback. And uh, if, if you're part of a master's program, such as the one that we deliver, you will certainly get feedback. Uh, we'll ask you to submit uh, videos for uh, feedback and assessment as well. Next thing was in Israel, they do have a simulation based assessment as well. Oh, that's good to know that in Israel also they have simulation based assessment. We also have simulation based assessment in our selection and in our annual appraisal of our trainees when they go. And the last question is in future, can we expect the uh, MSc program to potentially adapt towards aspects of robotic surgical training uh, as well? Yes, the answer is uh, uh, most certainly. We are uh, currently uh, uh, focused on uh, GI laparoscopic surgery. And there was a question from a gynecologist. So this year we have launched uh, uh, two modules in uh, basic gynecology and hysteroscopy. This is a joint program with the University of Malta uh, and uh, Queen Mary University of London. So I hope that answers all the question and uh, shall we move on to our next session now, which is uh, how do we do uh, cholecystectomy? So um, panel, is there anything else you'd like to add before we proceed further? Shafi, Dan? Uh, no, nothing, nothing to add. Those were really interesting questions um, and uh, they all bring out the importance of uh, surgical simulation. Uh, any human endeavour takes uh, quite a long time uh, to get into the mainstream. As Shafi will tell you, he's been a pioneer for years and people are now 
uh, seeing how important simulation is and how important digital education is. You've been at the coalface with your master's program. Uh, that last question asked about robotics in, in, in an MSc. We had a master's program in our MSc um, back in 2010. So I think all these questions about education in surgery are really important because I will always say it's the decisions that are more important than the incisions. Um, and so you have to have this cognitive process and part of simulation even though it's practical, is actually getting things to go through your hard disk. So I think very stimulating questions. I mean, absolutely, as it's sort of uh, well documented, a good operation is only 25% technical skill. And we have too much of focus and emphasis on technical skill and uh, a little on non-technical skill. We should be mindful of that. In our next session, we'll be uh, doing, um, uh, focusing on the non-technical skill that are required for in cholecystectomy. Uh, one last question before we proceed was, uh, thoughts about laparoscopic surgery during COVID regarding exposure and also training impact and de-skilling of trainees and trainer. So uh, uh, again, this is a self-directed uh, learning uh, is required and uh, uh, for specific, especially in laparoscopic surgery, uh, you know, you should, just like a good textbook, you should all have a box trainer. Uh, once we have uh, uh, simulation based training, recertification, revalidation, just like any good textbook, we'll all have to have it every, till we retire, a box trainer and an instrument in our house to practice. So there is no excuse to de-skill and there is no excuse not to buy a box trainer if you are a minimally invasive uh, surgeon or a trainee. And I think the other thing, I think Tan ran a, a webinar last week did you, on this kind of thing. Uh, Tan, so Tan had some value on the do's and don'ts of lap surgery. Of course, the first thing in COVID is that we operate very little, <laughs> nothing at all if you can avoid it, of course. Uh, most patients won't get an operation that we treated conservatively. But the run of laparoscopy is an interesting one. There's been a few papers out there from Italy and others. But Tam, you ran a whole uh, conference last week on that, didn't you? So um, this is, uh, 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 there, are two, there are three aspects of the, uh, the pandemic that uh, Shafi mentioned, you know, and the crisis was the thing that consumed everyone. And in order to deal with the crisis, everyone from whichever specialty had to stop surgery. And one of the concerns uh, was that we were doing complex laparoscopic procedures that may take up ITU beds. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, was laparoscopy going to cause uh, problems with uh, uh, infections to the healthcare workers? And was it going to contribute to uh, COVID infections and exacerbating problems um, for our patients? So this isn't such a patient issue, uh, although uh, we can debate lap versus open, um, but this is a, uh, let's say, let's look at the health uh, uh, impact on our surgeons and anaesthetists. So a lot of the data was extrapolated from hepatitis data and uh, data from uh, 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 papillomavirus in anaesthetists many years ago and and really that can be really put to the side the the chance uh, of getting a covid infection by aerosolization in an uh, uh, um, operating room environment with full personal protective equipment is minimal and there are i'm doing a webinar on wednesday with some surgeons from india and sri lanka and they've got some really interesting data on virology studies in the OR. So this is, you know, we, we're, as surgeons, we deal with bloodborne in, infection and, and uh, contamination all the time. We're not so good with aerosolization. In laparoscopy, aerosolization uh, happens uh, and can be a hazard in uh, two or three main areas. One is you have ports that are put in uh, poorly and you get an air leak between the skin and the ports. So this suddenly makes people think about whether they should be using balloon ports to secure uh, uh, this. The second thing is when you have instrument changes, uh, you are opening the valves and there'll be a little plume that comes out. So that's another potential hazard. 
The third thing is you are having uh, uh, gas and aerosolization within the peritoneal cavity. How are you dealing with uh, the viral load in there? The viral load is probably quite small, but um, what we should have is a filter that is less than one micron. So uh, on your smoke extraction system, you have to have an appropriate size filter, and that will also have an implication on, on the pressures and the flow of your insufflation. And the final thing is how do you desufflate and how do you extract a specimen? Uh, and there are several ways that have been described, as Shafi mentioned, in, in papers from Milan and from uh, Shanghai and Wuhan. So uh, extraction of the specimen requires uh, some of the pneumoperitoneum to have been extracted. It requires uh, a generous cut and you, you take out the specimen in a, in a safe way. You, when you desufflate, you should um, try and desufflate uh, through uh, a filter as we've just described but also uh, there have been some surgeons that are, have simply got the insufflation tubing made sure they've uh, aspirated to a, a, a low pressure and then they simply take out the um, insufflation tubing and attach to low pressure suction you have to be very careful because you can suck up bowel into port so you, one must be really really careful that you've taken down uh, as much of the uh, pneumoperitoneum as possible so if all of these precautions are taken laparoscopy is extremely safe and actually if you look at the harm to the patient which can be significant if you're doing a left-sided resection on an, a patient in their 70s and you do an open operation and they end up staying in hospital for several days with potential increase in chest complications you suddenly put the onus of uh, of, of catching covid uh, firmly back onto the patient so you have to be able to balance these things out and there are studies being done at imperial college uh, across the world and certainly some studies coming out of india and sri lanka now that will answer the question about um, airflow in theater and viral load so th there's some controversy still about negative pressure in operating theaters we still run at uh, normal pressure uh, positive pressure uh, uh, ventilation in our operating theaters at the moment on the advice of public health england and our microbiologists so i don't think laparoscopy is is uh, a hazard or a danger if you practice it on the correct patient with the correct surgeon and most importantly the correct steps all the way through those operative uh, interventions totally agree totally agree i think in the interest of time we'll move on to uh, how do we do uh, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and after that we will get the panel on the spot so i'll just take a, a short 10 minute session now presentation on uh, a safe cholecystectomy program So let me share my screen. Right, you can see my screen. So principles of uh, safe laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy, and I'm calling it sort of six by six strategies, but the six strategies that are broken down the operation into six uh, steps. Now, bile duct injury rate has increased since the introduction of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, in open cholecystectomy era, it was reported 0.1 to 0.2%, uh, whereas in lap coli, the reported rate is up to half a percent. Now, we all know that bile duct injury after cholecystectomy can be a life-altering uh, complication, uh, uh, both uh, for the patient as well as for the surgeon. And uh, uh, the key question over here is the traditional methods of teaching and training has failed to eliminate or reduce bile duct injury rate. So how can we improve training and education uh, now with a, a technology to have an impact on this? So SAGES have launched a safe uh, cholecystectomy program. The details are in this slide. If you want to make a note of it, it's free, it's available. 
for anyone to uh, go through the didactic uh, modules. It essentially revolves around uh, the principles of uh, safe cholecystectomy through the uh, sixth uh, strategy, which uh, I'll just go through in the next slide. So the first strategy is uh, using a critical view of uh, safety as a method of uh, ductal identification. Um, the second strategy, I mean, let me go back to this uh, critical view of safety. The definition of critical view of safety is um, you can see two structure entering the gallbladder with no fibrofatty tissue in the hepatocystic triangle and a third of the gallbladder separated from the liver bed. So these are the three criteria that have to be met before you clip and divide any tubular structure. And that is by definition critical view of safety. A lot of the time what we do is at this stage we start clipping and cutting, which is not a true critical view. A true critical view is where you have everything uh, as shown in this slide, all the fibro fatty tissue removed, gallbladder partially separated, and you can see only two structures entering the gallbladder. It's described as a dual critical view because when you flip the gallbladder to right and left, you should be able to see this anatomy before you uh, clip and divide any structure. The second strategy is obviously be aware of the anatomy, uh, the congenital anatomy and the anatomic variation and the acquired, which is the pathological distortion as a result of uh, repeated attacks of cholecystitis, acute and chronic inflammation. The third strategy is use of intraoperative imaging um, uh, if you are in doubt. The fourth strategy, which is recommended, is timeout. Now, uh, since the introduction of WHO checklist, we've got used to sort of signing and sign out. So a same similar strategy has been recommended by uh, sages uh, that you pause for a second, take a step back and have a timeout with your team in theater to say, fine, I think we've completed the dissection. We've got the, we've achieved the critical view and uh, it is now time to clip and cut because once you clip and uh, divide a tubular structure and if it is the wrong structure, then there's no coming back. The fifth strategy is bailout, which is stop the dissection, even stop the operation. Look at alternative methods for finishing the operation. You don't have to complete the operation. Uh, as long as the patient is not bleeding, you can uh, wake up the patient and pass it on to a specialist unit or an HPV center, an upper GI surgeon. So don't feel compelled to finish the operation. Uh, the sixth strategy is call for help, get a second surgeon. Even if you are a consultant surgeon, there's no harm in asking for another uh, colleague to come and join you in theater if you feel that you can safely proceed. It is important uh, to uh, keep uh, these sort of six strategies in mind. Just to sort of recap uh, the six strategies. Critical view of safety for ductal identification, anatomic variation, both congenital and acquired, intraoperative imaging, timeout, bailout, and call for help. Now I'll show, take you uh, through uh, the cholecystectomy procedure, which I've broken down into six steps. And I call this, I've described this as sort of the first two steps, which are blunt dissection of the calots in the calots triangle, where you pinch and peel the peritoneum starting just below Hartman's pouch of the cystic duct. Then you dissect the visceral peritoneum that is covering the calots triangle. And step three is when you actually dive into the calots triangle to go behind the cystic duct and cystic artery. Step four is when you uh, do your complete dissection to achieve critical view. And step five is when you divide the cystic duct, cystic artery. Step six is gallbladder separation. So these six steps are well described in the short video uh, that you'll see now. This is just a short five minute video. I'd like you to see. So that's the first step where we are just simply doing blunt dissection in Callot's triangle, avoid using monopolar diathermy because heat conducted from monopolar diathermy can cause damage, ischemic damage to uh, injury to common bile duct up to a centimeter, depending on the power setting and uh, the duration. 
So the second step is you're simply dissecting the visceral peritoneum that is covering the callous triangle, both anteriorly and posteriorly. Don't be too tempted to dive into the triangle to go behind the cystic duct and cystic artery. Just simply peel off the peritoneum, the visceral peritoneum anteriorly and posteriorly, and then you can divide. Now, as you can see, the hook is not in contact with tissue underneath and the heat conduction will, there won't be any heat conduction uh, in the inferior aspect of the hook. So once you've done this and you're reaching the gallbladder liver junction, you can start with step three, which is your actual calloid strangle dissection, staying close to the gallbladder, So over here we can see two tubular structure. And this is not critical view. Till we start separating the gallbladder from the liver bed, that, that way we can be absolutely sure. Being 100% sure is not enough in laparoscopic surgery, in my opinion. You need to be 200% sure before you divide any tubular structure. So now we are separating the gallbladder from the liver bed. Always use the hooked diathermy after doing a bit of blunt dissection and tissue separation. Therefore, th that way you'll have little contact of the hook with underlying tissue. So you start to separate the gallbladder. Don't be tempted to clip and cut the ducts. So I think I'll just speed up a bit. We've divided. You can see the point of division at the point of division and after division, there should not be any more pending dissection. The only last step after clipping and dividing any tubular structure should be gallbladder separation. So that completes uh, the six steps of the cholecystectomy procedure and the sixth strategy uh, as described by sages in the safe cholecystectomy program. So what I'm going to do next now is put our panel on the spot. I've got a, a video quiz of uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So uh, let me see. Uh, there was one question, looks like from a gynecologist, whether the modules uh, in the master's course, uh, cholecystectomy and bowel anastomosis, uh, they are not for gynecologists. If you're a gynecologist, uh, there are separate modules in gynecology. Uh, and um, gynecologists have also enrolled and done this course. Can I just say, Bijan, um, when I ran the master's program, um, we found it very uh, helpful to have multiple specialties focusing on the basic steps, particularly working together and doing some simulation. And then they did their gynecology modules or urology modules yeah. or general surgery. Yeah. So this is that, that's what I would encourage. Okay. So, shall we start with our um, video? Uh, may, any any comments from you about the um, any tips and tricks on cholecystectomy? So, sort of, this is what I mean. You know, I follow religiously the safe cholecystectomy program. I, I think if you follow those steps, Bij, and you can't go too far wrong. And the problem is that we get complacent. That's the key issue. We're under time pressure. The day case is going on. You're trying to train someone quickly. And all that is is just taking chances and risk. What I've seen from your perspective, Bijan, and working with you closely, is that you're very rigorous about how you're going to do this every single time. And I think that is the most important part of reducing the risks at the moment, right? Dan? Um, so just to reiterate both your points, um, you have enormous respect for any operation. Uh, I think the cholecystectomy is the one that there are so many traps uh, and it's very easy to lose concentration. Um, it's like playing cricket when you're batting, you have to concentrate continuously 
on every single ball that comes. And I think that the cholecystectomy has several uh, steps that on their own seem quite simple. But if you take your eye off it, you can miss something and you lose situational awareness and you become slightly tunnel visioned. And so, and that can lead to a catastrophe. And of course, the question that we all ask the person who's assisting us is, uh, that was a cystic duct, wasn't it? Or that was this. And, and most of the time, the human factors uh, uh, dictate that they will tell you what you want to hear. Mm. So uh, utter respect. Absolutely. I think the key thing is to sometimes just pause and take a step back before getting carried away. I think that's the only thing that will help you, not only in polycystectomy, but whenever you're in a difficult situation. Lillian, would you like to comment from a trainee's perspective? I'm actually just going to ask if I may. Um, I, was, uh, I was your trainee and um, actually learning laparoscopic cholecystectomy through your method, through the six steps, uh, was the perfect way to learn cholecystectomy because really when, when you do, do something method, method, uh, methodically, you kind of avoid, you, you avoid getting getting you know getting into trouble because the anatomy can be can be can vary you might have difficult cold cystectomies to do it, even in, as a trainee and if you do it if you have a method then you're less likely to injure the, the common bile duct and that's the biggest fear isn't it you don't want to do that as a trainee or ever even absolutely i think as a technique you follow the six steps and as a strategy uh, what sages have recommended i think if you just follow those then uh, you can't uh, harm the patient. Yeah. So let's move on to and uh, put our panel on the spot and see what uh, they would do uh, when faced with a difficult gallbladder. So I'm going to play uh, a, a short video clips. They're all about one minute long. And um, uh, we'll ask the panel what they would do in this situation. So we've just started the operation. Let me just pause for a second so that to uh, help you orient. We're looking at uh, the gallbladder. This is the inflamed gallbladder, that's the liver. And over here, you've got uh, whatever is stuck to the hot gallbladder. And the question over here is, when you have such adhesions on the gallbladder from chronic inflammation, how would you separate these uh, adhesions? These are not just sort of flimsy or mental adhesions we're talking about. Shafi, do you want to go first? or? Sure. So it says uh, diathermy, scissors, harmonic scalp, or none of the above, all of the above. So the answer is none of the above. Um, it's kind of too dangerous. At the moment, you can't identify it. It's hard, it's rigid. It's a very thick and gallbladder wall. And all of those things would probably make holes in the gallbladder, make inadvertent injuries. So the first one is identifying it correctly, using very gentle traction, maybe using a small swab or even suction, a bit of water, just push it away find those spaces and see if you can dissect first and identify correctly where the wall is. So that's what I'll do first and foremost and understand what we need to do next. Dan? So, um, yeah, to, to add to that, um, so first of all, take stock of the situation. So, you know, a gallbladder is not a gallbladder is not a gallbladder. There, there are three or four different operations that we can have, and this is a complex gallbladder. So you have to stop, take stock, and then make a plan. There's no point rushing in. Uh, so you have a strategy. And as Shafi quite clearly said, I wouldn't go for sharp or energy-driven dissection here. Absolutely. If it's so adhesions think... on the gallbladder, with some hydro dissection, and, and then proceed carefully with care. So uh, that's the right answer. I think I would not use any form of energy because we don't know what, what this is. So which is my, uh, I mean, what I do over here is uh, uh, using um, uh, suction irrigation, as you said, you know, hydro dissection or just sort of blunt dissection. If it gently peels off, fine. But if not, don't use force, don't use any energy device to separate that. 
So that's what we do over here. You can see this is sort of not a, a structure that you should just take it for granted. Uh, what do you think that uh, structure is? Can you name that? What What is the likely structure or the uh, cause of adhesion over there? I think that's probably the duodenum. Lillian, do you think it's duodenum? I'd be worried that that might be the duodenum. <laughs> Uh, which which structure uh, yeah. which structure is it what's where the blue the arrow is? Yeah, where the blue arrow is. What's sort of stuck to the gallbladder? Well, it could be transosteral. You're looking the fundus, yeah. right? So it could be yeah. transosteral yeah. being hoisted up, and that's the worry. Um, in on the left hand side, as you see, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the, the big the biggest concern is uh, underneath that omentum. You don't know how many millimeters you have till you go into the transverse colon hepatic flexure. So I think until you otherwise, you have to take it that this is sort of colon which is attached or stuck to the gallbladder from the inflammation. And, and that was the reason, if you would go back to the first question, would you use any energy devices? The answer is no, because, you know, you may make a hole in the gallbladder and, you know, you, you can deal with that. But if you make a hole in the colon, then that is going to turn a, a, a difficult operation into a completely complicated, nightmarish situation. So it is transverse colon, it is a colon which is stuck over there. And when you have such thick adhesions over there or sort of a chunky momentum, uh, don't think it is just sort of a fat or an obese patient, it's just a fatty, chunky momentum. Think of the transverse colon, which is likely to be stuck over there. And hence be careful uh, and uh, not use any sharp or energy devices. So now, We've done a bit of blunt dissection. We are holding on to the, we are retracting the gallbladder and you can see there's uh, now from the retraction, my uh, retractor has punctured the gallbladder. There's pus pouring out. And um, you can sort of guess which way everything is going to go. <laughs> so over here, uh, Lillian, there's a question to you. At your stage, what would you do uh, if this was going on live now? So there's pus coming out of the gallbladder. I would. Um... There's pus coming out, and we sort of, you know, obviously perforate the gallbladder, trying to hold and retract. It's sort of slowly falling apart. Suction, call the boss, tell the nurses <laughs> to call him some antibiotics or the patient's antibiotics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, think of the six strategy which I told you. Call yeah. for help. You know, if you're not sure, call for help. You can bail out if you want to. Would you? Uh, not immediately. I think I, I don't think I'd bail out. Okay, Shafi. Uh, as you surgeon, so here again, uh, the practice takes stock of the situation. Right? We know it's difficult from the beginning of the operation. It's going to be difficult. It's hard. It's horrible. It's infected. It's inflamed. First of all, you just suck out a bit of pus, get control, yeah, take your time. If you make a small hole in the gallbladder itself, you might use that if it's to, to suck everything inside it, for example, to collapse it further to help you, so you can grip it better. Um, and to be very gentle, what you need to know, first of all, is that you have to be gentle. You can't be too rigorous here. It's very flimsy and it perforates. Um, you'll ensure that there needs to put some antibiotics on board um, as well, because you can get some splash across, and just wash out the area and take stock and then see whether you can come back and hold it in better position, reposition yourself, reposition the gallbladder, and then see whether uh, it's still gonna be um, something that's safe to proceed with. But back in mind, you're always thinking, is it safe to proceed? Is it safe to proceed? As long as it's safe and you're, and you're progressing, then it's okay. If it's anyway it's not safe or you're not progressing, you're going to be in much more danger, of course. John, I'm, so, I'm gonna ask you, uh, you are a junior surgeon, you're a consultant just in the, the first couple of years as a consultant. You've done about so, 100 uh, cholecystectomies, 100 okay. cholecystectomies, and that's all you have. So what, what you see there is, is the first operation I did at Colchester. I, I was a senior registrar, uh, and uh, it was a Monday morning. And what I did in this situation, I felt I was at, at consultant level, um, but what I did was I stopped and there were two things that went through my head. Uh, what are the options? What's the, what's the big picture? Am I going to take this gallbladder out? 
And if I'm going to take the gallbladder out, am I going to do a partial cholecystectomy, a subtotal cholecystectomy? Mm. Uh, what about cholangiograms, etc.? So I was thinking that, and I stopped. I, my hands stopped moving, uh, which is important because very often you see trainees continue to work. The second thing is I called, I phoned a friend. Yeah. So I called a consult, senior consultant colleague. Because when you look back at this, if there is an injury, if there's uh, a bad outcome, you've got to be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, I went, I, I, I did everything that I could. So that's not being scared, but this is, this is on the hard end of the scale. Yeah. And, you know, in, in 15 years time, you may be do, able to do it on your own, but I might, I wasn't at that stage. No, absolutely right. I think that's the correct answer. So um, let's move on. So we decide to proceed further. But with this gallbladder, I think one of the problem uh, we are going to face is actually getting a grip on the gallbladder. So difficult difficulty in retracting the gallbladder, the fundus in the Hartman's pouch. So what, what are your, the question to panel is, what, what are your sort of techniques to overcome that? Uh, even if it is not a horrible gallbladder, as you see in this video, in terms of uh, uh, troubleshooting when you have difficulty actually getting a grip on the fundus or the Hartman pouch, what would you do? What option do you have? So um, I put the umbilical port in first, then my next port is the epigastric port. And if I see this situation, having put uh, a port in the uh, 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 right side, the right flank, then I will try and puncture the gallbladder before it bursts itself yeah i'll i'll put a sucker into the gallbladder and suck out the bile and i'll look at the color of the bile is it white bile is it pus is it uh is it black bile green bile yeah. um and then i will withdraw the port from inside the gallbladder and i will put a, my grasper on that hole and now i've closed any further leakage if i can yeah. If I get to this stage, I simply put the sucker in, suck it all out, and then I've got a deflated gallbladder. I think you're right. If the gallbladder is uh, uh, difficult to grasp, suck it out, empty the gallbladder and its content, and you'll find that you will be able to get uh, some form of grip and uh, proceed with the, the operation. Because the worst thing is having bad exposure and a difficult operation that is just your like you're tying your hands behind your back and trying to operate um shafi any would you yeah. do a sprinkling no no i agree listen uh, it's always about proceeding with caution you know and i agree i often um would perforate make a small hole just to suction out a bit Suck it out yeah to take yeah. out because it's just about getting grip isn't it if you can't get yeah. grip happy proceed you've got to lift yeah. it retract it above the liver so the first thing is to how do you do that it, well that you'd have to perfect you can put a little needle in from the top uh vision a small needle from the abdominal surface with yeah. a syringe and suck out some of it if necessary holds a bit smaller makes it easier yeah. um, and that's the first thing because unless you've done that you can't really proceed safely so here's it saying if i can't do that how am i going to approach the the hartman's pouch I get into the um, color triangle, etc. Sometimes, conversely, that bit's difficult, and the other bit's actually easier because inflamed at the top end. Yeah. To get down to the other part, it's actually less. It's softer for some reason, right? But we see that yeah. sometimes. Yeah. No, I think so. The thing about uh, emptying the gallbladder out, if you're having difficulty uh, retracting it. Yeah. Um, however, um, so I mean, what what happens? Obviously, this gallbladder is uh, impacted with stone. So it was uh, not uh, something that you could just sort of suck out the bile. Mm. You can see it's chopper block. Yeah. So even after sucking, uh, there was problem uh, retracting the gallbladder. So I'm fishing all the stones out in an endo pouch <laughs> and using a tooth grasper to yeah. uh, pick up the Normally, I would use a your hand, but uh, use a tooth grasper. It's important to tell all the students this is not normal. No, <laughs> you don't expect these cases routinely, right? So I'm glad you're uh, scaring them, frightening them appropriately, so that they um, <laughs> uh, proceed with caution. And I, I think I think that's a sorry to to interrupt no, no. you, Bijan. 
I think Shafi's point is really important. You know, as a junior surgeon or as a trainee, you might may be told, you know, there's a patient having a gallbladder removed. And you can get something like this, which is horrific. And usually they happen on a Friday at about 3 p.m. Or you can get a nice blue gallbladder um, that is really, really simple. Yeah. And your cognitive and mental approach, the way you use your assistant and how you talk to your anaesthetist are different for both because this is going to take an investment of time this is a hurry up and wait operation you know just step by step lillian question for you uh we've removed the stone sucked out the gallbladder now what do you think about just bailing out putting a foley's catheter and come out you see, I mean, this is like a nightmare unfolding, isn't it? As a, as a trainee, this is sort of the kind of nightmare that you don't want. If you're stuck as a trainee, you can't call for help. There's nobody around. As Dan said, you know, Friday afternoon, four o'clock, nobody's interested. Absolutely. So what you options do, have you got? I think you do the safest thing. You suction, remove as many of the state stones and the pus as possible, wash out and leave a drain in and bail out. I, I wouldn't, I mean, if that is if no help is, is coming coming to you no help is coming which is yeah. usually i mean the real life scenario is we say phone a friend and call and all but you know we'll be lucky to get through somebody especially uh, uh, you know towards the end of a working day yeah. if you're stuck doing a difficult operation so yes i think just uh, remove the stone empty the gallbladder and just bail out leave a drain in Okay, so over here, we were talking about the retracting gallbladder and trying to get exposure uh, retraction, but uh, this situation again is uh, quite common. Your anesthetists sometimes have inflated the stomach. You may not have put in an NG tube, or even if you have, your uh, exposure of callus strangle is poor. You have limited view, and uh, even if the gallbladder was not so badly inflamed, what would you do if you have problems visualizing the hepatocystic triangle or your area of interest where you have to do your dissection. So Shafi, you want to comment first? Yeah, obviously this so is difficulty visualizing. Yeah. The visualizing the what the um uh the triangle. Triangle. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so you've done all the things already you've said you've moved the patient around a little bit, yeah. maybe your head up. Uh, right side up, for example, you might have aspirated the stomach or an NG tube, and all the things that will give you more space is helpful. A bit more retraction, pushing on that gallbladder a bit further, hence importance of having being soft gallbladder and push up. Um, then you have a look, and then you literally use your suction only, no, no, nothing sharp, just to look around, feel your way around this. And the question you ask yourself, is it actually possible? Is it dangerous? Am I gonna put this patient in danger? Or can I proceed with caution with safety. So I would literally just move things around, uh, Bijan, see mm. if I get hold of Hartman's patch a little bit, see if the plane opens up a little bit where I can potentially do a trial dissection, uh, potentially, with a view that if that trial isn't safe or is difficult, you'll then bail out and do, do something else. Yeah, you might be converting, you might have a draining if you have perforated already. But here you really open the stones everywhere. Yeah. Therefore, the conversion might be a possibility here. It's much more possibility than it was mm -hmm. a while ago. But those things are on your mind as you, as you proceed. Yeah. Lillian, what would you do to improve the exposure? Uh, I mean, the things that Prof Ahmed suggested, that's what we normally would, would try and do to improve the exposure. Um, the other thing I was wondering, would an extra port help at all? Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I was looking for. So don't hesitate to put in an extra port. Use 30 degree camera, change your laparoscope if you're not using it. A lot of the time you just sort of go ahead with a zero degree. So uh, the practical things to do, the practical tips, if you're having problems with exposure of callus triangle, even with a, you know, not a bad gallbladder, is use 30 degree camera, put in an extra port, empty out the stomach, and see if that gives you the right exposure. Giving head up and slightly tilting the patient uh, left, uh, right up and left down. So these are the practical things you can do. Anything else, Stan, you'd like to add? Yes. For exposure. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I, I always uh, think about, you know, take refuge in anatomy 
and one can always come in from lateral. You're going to do very little harm laterally. Uh, the second thing is we always say in Colchester are fives for free. So the additional port. Yes. Um, can you can you help with the exposure? And the number three is that um, I use Indocyanine Green uh, to help uh look at the the bar ducts and it's particularly helpful in these sort of instances i'm conscious that not everyone has access to this um, but i think if you go by the first two principles of coming in laterally and an extra port you may give yourself a little bit of a room for maneuver absolutely yeah so let's move on to our next uh, question which is uh, you you've achieved a good exposure now you managed to sort of get a view of the hepatocystic triangle but as you can see it's rock solid it's frozen so your hand my left hand instrument is holding on the hartman's pouch and you've got tough fibrous tissue in the talus triangle so uh, looking just looking at the picture Lillian, what's the condition? What what do you see over there? You are muted. Sorry, the main worry here is that the CBD might be tenting tenting up into Callow's triangle, and you're so not. What's the condition called? Um, you got a stone over here. Oh, like a Meritzi. Meritzi, Meritzi. Yeah. So that's what we're looking for. And um, bail out or proceed with dissection. So the answer, one answer, one word, one or two. I think bail I out. One, one, just bail out from me. <laughs> bail out. Okay. If it's me by myself, bail out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just asking for an honest answer. Uh, what what you would do? There's nothing wrong, and I think that's the right thing to do. To bail out. Um, Shafi. Yeah, really difficult one. So here at this point, I would ask for help, number one. I'd get a, another colleague to have a look at it with me mm -hmm. to think about, look, if this is a meritsis, uh, it's difficult. And here, look, the, the, the chance of um, damaging are great, um, having strictures, having injury. So if I had a colleague who's about a biliary, I may approach them, for example, you might have to reconstitute the biliary tract, or you might even think about opening and just doing a subtotal uh, cholecystectomy uh, and getting away with that, for example, leaving taking the stones out, closing the defect, and leaving that in the drain, that would be one yeah. option. Uh, that's if you had no expertise in emergencies mm -hmm. that might be available. If you had a good HPV surgeon and you're much more experienced, you might still think about how you might proceed and get another opinion on this one. But yeah. the chance of converting are really high on this case, Vijan, um, and bailing out. Fran? Okay, so I, I would take a slightly different approach to Shafi. Um, I think you have to be, think very carefully about um uh, damage uh, and the consequences of your action i don't think you should be foolhardy and say right i must finish this operation uh, but i would do everything i could possibly to avoid uh, a conversion to open surgery because there are two options that are that are better i think one is to uh, you know you can put a, a drain wash out, come back another day. You've got very, very expert uh, um, upper GI HPB surgeons who may want to have uh, a go at this when the inflammation is slightly better. The other option you have is to laparoscopically uh, do a subtotal colectomy, uh, cholecystectomy, don't do the colectomy, <laughs> do a co cholecystectomy. And we've actually published a paper on this. And that first case that I told you about uh, when I was a senior registrar. In fact, my colleague came and showed me this wonderfully safe operation um, that actually has got me out of a lot of trouble. And you have to watch the patient like a hawk afterwards. You have to ensure that you don't say, okay, that's it and it's all finished. Mm -hmm. But it does give the patient another dimension uh, of, of safely treated for their surgical pathology um, so I, I'm not saying don't convert to open surgery but I would try and avoid whilst being safe I certainly wouldn't proceed 
trying to take out this gallbladder with significant hindrance uh, and discount open surgery. Uh, what I'm saying is I think there are alternatives before you get to that. Correct. So I think uh, for, for the audience, uh, your uh, approach should be uh, either bail out or think about um, um, anything other than a total cholecystectomy, like subtotal cholecystectomy. I would not again convert to open. Uh, then, you know, uh, I think my generation, Shafi Tan, we, we've done uh, open cholecystectomy in our time, but I think looking at where you guys are, uh, uh, most of you will have little or no experience in doing open cholecystectomy. So it's far more dangerous to convert unless you're experienced and you're safer to just bail out in that situation. So the options you have is drain, bail out, or uh, 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 do subtotal cholecystectomy. Do not attempt to dissect and separate the gallbladder uh, from here because that is just simply asking for trouble. So, which is what I do in this uh, case is uh, go for, uh, because there was already a, a hole in the fundus of the gallbladder, stones were removed, and uh, um, the gallbladder was just sort of falling apart. So, uh, I just abandoned the idea of uh, doing anything in Callot's triangle and started to sort of uh, uh, remove the gallbladder retrograde with a view of doing subtotal. But it, it, it's never simple and it's never safe as it sounds. Um, what you'll get is uh, this, bleeding. It's inflamed, it's hot, and plus you've not tied off the vessel. So how are you going to manage this bleeding? So first of all, it's always about putting pressure, first of all. Um, be gentle, getting control, suction and pressure, swab. Letting people know that there's a bleeder going on, that you might need to have blood available, all the usual things to make sure you, you buy yourself time. So the first thing is just to be patient. You know, the, there's the four Ps, isn't that right, uh, uh, Bijan? It's, uh, <laughs> it's the pressure. It's the patients, is that right? Um, right. And then there's the platelets. Yeah. And the fourth one that Professor Williams did tell us about was prayer. So yeah. we'll, we'll kind of add that at the end of the three Ps to make it four. Yeah. So that's the first thing you'll do here. You're gonna to have to probably think about suturing, I guess at some stage, uh, to have the skills required for that um, as it's hosing out from the bottom end, because this is difficult. Uh, it's hosing, it's difficult, you put pressure on. You find the isolated point, are you dealing with a major vessel injury or is it cystic artery? Can you safely diathermy? Huge questions here. Um, so if you're a trainee, you'd call for help straight away. Of course you would. You know, as a senior person, you might also ask for help and support from a colleague, etc. So you might need more ports. You might need more control, more expertise to help support you through this difficult problem. But the issues are around pressure, so stopping it, make sure patient's safe. Second thing about, is it suturing safe here? Can I use... Um, uh, heating like either diathermy or, some, or harmonic safe in this area, is it possible? Um, it's usually not so safe. Uh, those are things I have to be thinking about. Dan? Uh, so uh, I agree with those four P's that uh, uh, Shafi mentioned. I think it's really interesting because this is the patient that post-operatively will develop a hematoma, spike a temperature, uh, um, drain will get blocked, uh, they start to go a bit yellow, uh, and everyone becomes very worried. So you have to start thinking about uh, treating this uh, pathology very carefully at the time of, of the initial surgery. You know, I think if you get uncontrolled bleeding, of course, the pressure is very important. But I usually start off, as you have done here, and there's always bleeding from the sides, from the, uh, the cut edge. Uh, so I very carefully put the diathermy onto my peatlands and uh, work my way down. The problem is you have to be very careful with diathermy because you can get uh, 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 
current jumping onto other structures and you've got structures close by and particularly capacitance, capacitance coupling uh, with the ports, depending on what type of ports you're using. But you can work your way around these very carefully. It's painstakingly slow, which is why I said up front, I thought it would look like this. Um, <laughs> you, you, you basically diathermy around and you come down to Hartman's pouch. And hopefully by that time, you will have uh, got much less bleeding and have it all under control. You have to have skills to suture if required uh, laparoscopically. And again, it's going to be a uh, it's going to be tiger country uh, in terms of what you're suturing and also your vision because there might be bleeding there. So you need a very patient uh, uh, camera holder, and you need to make sure the scrub nurse is aware. So I usually stop. And I say, okay, we've got some bleeding. I've got some pressure. It's all under control. This is what we're going to do. This is what I need. Make sure that the scrub nurse knows exactly what, what it is. I usually stand on a step when I start suturing uh, in the biliary, um, uh, when I'm doing a biliary operation. But generally, this will stop with uh, simple diathermy and quartery. Yeah. yeah, I think I agree. I think just to summarize for the... Uh, audience, um, we, we are still relatively higher up on the gallbladder. It is an arterial bleed, as we can see, sort of, you know, it's going against the gravity, shooting up. So possibly branch uh, of cystic artery. Um, the first thing is to apply pressure, stop, inform uh, people you've got bleeding so that uh, your team can prepare in case this is something major. Uh, try that, tell me over here, I have, was using harmonic scalpel because the gallbladder was so thick uh, after attempting to use a, a, a hook, uh, I felt I was just wasting time. So I had the uh, harmonic scalpel and the bleeding was from the gallbladder wall, um, which I managed to very easily control with one uh, grip. Uh, of the gallbladder wall, but you can use uh, peatlins, Maryland faucets, and uh, attach uh, diathermy to that. But uh, the approach should be stop, pressure, wait, put in an extra port, make sure that you have good exposure before you proceed. Now, after sort of uh, going further down the gallbladder, I thought uh, I'll be a bit clever. And uh, rather than leaving the posterior gallbladder wall behind, it, it looked like as if it was getting peeled off relatively easily. So is this something that you will attempt to do? Lillian, yes or no? No. Why? Uh, I think you risk there's no way of knowing what the, uh, the plane is because it's so fibrose. So it's, it will be very difficult to remove that off the cystic plate without injuring vessels, I would have thought. Um, that would probably... Well, first of all, let's go back to your basics, your first six things you were doing, Bijan. And well, those ports is about a critical view. Yeah. And you're not demonstrating a critical view here. And there's no, no. way. You see that triangle, you're not seeing the, no. the liver plus the angle, etc. So by definition, if you're not seeing the critical view, it's not safe. You can put pulling all sorts of things. It can be abnormal anatomy, it can be abductor lushka there, for example. There's so many things happening here. It can yeah. be unsafe. So I'd say that no is the answer in that sense. Correct, correct. Tan? Um, Posterior wall of the gallbladder, stuck onto the liver bed. Um, I would uh, leave it well alone. Mm -hmm. I, I leave the posterior wall on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just, well. you know, I take, I take the front, front, I take the front wall off. Yeah. Um, we have seen a couple of cases. Well, one particular case where we we uh, did the subtotal cholecystectomy, and unfortunately, it was not done in the correct manner, yeah. and the gallbladder um, sort of reformed as a little walnut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so what I make sure is that you go all the way down to Hartman's pouch and you must extract all the stones Yes. and then take the front wall off. And then I leave the back wall on and I, I diathermy destroy, ablate the mucosa. Absolutely. And I think that's fine, safe. I think that 
the well summarized by our panel do not attempt uh, to do this uh, you've not achieved critical view so do not dream about doing a total cholecystectomy if you're doing subtotal cholecystectomy stick to that strategy what you will get if you try to remove the gallbladder posterior gallbladder wall which is stuck to the liver you'll take off a slice of liver and you'll get major bleeding from the liver bed even if you don't cause any injury you can get significant bleeding from the gallbladder fossa itself, which could be, you know, uh, post-operatively give, give rise to further collections and infection and all sorts of things. Yeah. So the safest thing is to do not get tempted, even if it looks like this. I think I was stupidly trying to separate a little bit and I thought I might get away with it, but uh, no. And uh, as uh, one uh, would expect, the next thing you'll get is bleeding from the liver bed because you're literally, you know, slicing off a bit of the liver. So if you've got bleeding in the gallbladder bed, whether it's in this situation or uh, otherwise, how would you manage that, Lillian? So bleeding from the gallbladder fossa. Yeah. So, I mean, I think going back to the, the principles of, um, as you were saying, controlling the, the bleeding pressure um suction mm. i i found that diathermy works best in this area sort of like a but what's the problem when you use diathermy on the liver what happens i mean one of the things that i've seen happen is that it, it, it the bleeding doesn't really stop and you just end up creating lots of injury in that area yeah. why does that happen um, is it because uh, it, 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 the, I, I, I'm guessing well, it's I think it, because uh, when you're using monopolar diathermy yeah. and you're trying to stop the bleeding you just want to keep buzzing over there at a very high setting yeah. as a result the effect of monopolar diathermy is you get uh, uh, desiccation and dehydration of the tissue yeah. and uh, it's just like third degree bun burn, scar formation. So the liver is friable and brittle. So all you do is you stop the bleeding for a second and as soon as you lift up the hook, the burnt tissue is stuck to the hook yeah. and you just create a deeper wound into the liver. <laughs> you just dig deep. Just yeah. It's a vicious circle, you keep going on and on and it keeps bleeding more and more. You can't forget why. And so don't do it in the beginning. Uh, very quickly, Vijana, I have to disappear for another webinar now. Um, just tell You've you got just two more questions. Uh, okay, I can make yeah. a Okay, okay, all right, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, okay, well, well so, yeah, I'm the, you land, land up digging deep. I mean, remember, if you think about trauma and liver injuries, by definition, by classification, this is going to be a very, very minor injury. It looks catastrophic when you, even, when you get bleeding like this during lap coli. So the best thing is to sort of put pressure and wait rather than trying to keep burning over there. And you can put a bit of flow seal or a surgery cell or something. So we... Uh, the bleeding stops. I removed the anterior wall of the gallbladder. And... Um, what we are cauterizing is just the sort of the mucosa on the posterior wall. As you can see over here. And uh, now the last thing is, how do we manage this stump? Any thoughts, Dan? Sorry, I just missed that. Could you repeat that? So what we've done is we've, we've removed the anterior wall of the gallbladder. Yeah. And uh, we're burning the mucosa. And now we're yeah. left with this little stump. Yeah, so I, I, you have to make sure that this is secure because um, you don't want... So uh, you need to make sure that that's the cystic duct that you're actually going to uh, close off. I prefer to use a vicral endoloop. Yeah. Um, 
and I use a, a peat lens to, to grasp it, you know, you could be brave and use clip. Yeah. Lillian, can you hear us? I've lost Dan. I can't hear him. Oh, did you did you did you hear that? No, no. We just no. Oh, so I I said uh, there are a couple of options. A, a well applied um, endo loop is the simplest thing to do. Um, however, it depends on what you've got there. You've got to have again the ability to suture if at all necessary um, and you must be certain of the structure that you are getting control of. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Ovi, in, in this case uh, the, the stump was quite big and chunky um, and uh, I, I just took a stitch over there. Yeah. But in reality, uh, and in my experience, most of the time you'll find with the uh, Meritzi and such fibrotic uh, gallbladder and calloid triangle, the cystic duct is actually blocked and obliterated. So um, uh, if you're not able to do anything, uh, the, you know, just leave a drain and come out and accept a little bile leak. You can do an ERCP uh, the following day and uh, just accept a controlled uh, leak from the cystic duct, uh, leave a drain, and you can manage it that way if you're not able to uh, do suturing or if you can't get an endo loop around. So that's how I complete the operation. I, I, I do take a stitch, bit of flow seal in the gallbladder uh, bed, I leave a drain, and uh, a patient made uh, an eventful uh, recovery. So thank you, uh, Shafi, Tan, Lillian, for that uh, contribution. Thank you so much. Uh, anything you'd like thank to you. add? No. Yeah, it's, it's if, the guys, if the guys aren't webinar heavy after this one, they can join me with Raphael Grossman, who's a futurist from Maine Hospital in America, talking about the future of surgery. So if you need that, there's a link on my Twitter file feel free to join us from six to seven o'clock. Bridget, good luck and well done. Congrats. Thanks. Thanks. I think, um, uh, thanks, Dan, as well. Um, really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm glad. Thanks for contributing. Thanks for coming over. Uh, okay. I was thinking of doing it once a month, a short uh, teaching session. So uh, uh, I'll uh, keep you in the loop. Yeah, uh, our trainees would love that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye now. Bye. So I think for the rest, okay. So um, we use endo loop to tie the base of an appendix. You can uh, put it around gallbladder on the cystic duct if you're doing a retrograde cholecystectomy. As you heard in our discussion, you can use it to uh, put it on cystic duct, uh, stump, fallopian tube, any tubular structure. Um, a lot of the time endo loops are readily available, but uh, if you learn to make your own endo loop, it's an important skill that you can use and it can be transferred over into extracorporal knot tying, extracorporal suturing, uh, even doing anastomosis. Right. So that was um, uh, extracorporal knot tying or making a rotor's knot. If you don't have an assistant, you can just sort of use a teacup or a hook, a uh, door handle, or just around the arm of a table or a chair. Does anybody want to uh, try doing it live just now online? So it's as if you go around the cystic duct. Yeah, I'm around the cystic duct now. Okay. Yeah. Just raise your arm a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah okay. This is my phone. I'm sitting again for you again. So you made uh, your first square knot, reef yeah, knot. This, this is my first square knot, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay but I hold the two in, in my in bits of thumb. Yeah. The next thing is you're making a two 360 degree loop. Yeah. 
So with the table. This is one. Yeah. Uh, this is two. Yeah. Just lift your, raise your arm up. That's it. That's better. Yeah. Keep your raise. Uh, yeah. Raise your arm. Okay. Just raise it a bit more. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, work at that height. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now you're locking it on one side. Yes. Okay. And now you'll slide. And then unlock and slide. That's yeah, right. that's unlocking. Yeah. Now you're sliding it. Okay. Excellent. Well done. Unlock. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You can stop sharing now. Thank you. That was well done. Just use a slightly bigger piece of string and stay away from the object because okay. on your screen we could see a lot of the lamp and your hand, everything was crowded ah, so you. In live demonstration you can use a slightly bigger piece of string as you saw in my demonstration video you can stay away at a distance and that yes. way we can see you better thank you so yeah so this will be my needle end oh lovely that's much better yeah I will start with the uh, with the reef knot. Yeah. Okay. Going twice around. One, twice. And then half. Tidying up my knot. And I can. That's it. So then it's secure. Next thing you can do is you can uh, use just your stitching thread. That you get in a, you know, you don't need to buy expensive vicryl and monocryl or anything of that. So you can just use a fishing line or you can just buy uh, the threads that you use uh, for stitching buttons and tailor, a tailoring yes. shop. And you practice using a 75 centimeter in length uh, of a thread or suture material because in operating theater, what you get is 75 centimeter long uh, suture which comes in your suture pack. Uh, so initially you can practice with a, a long uh, string and a thread but afterwards you should uh, using a fishing line or um, just an ordinary tailoring thread you can keep practicing. When you're putting a thread around cystic duct you know you just cut the needle out and pass the thread bring it out to the same port. Uh, but if you were to do extra corporal suturing, you can do the same thing with the needle, pass the needle through the tissue, take a stitch, bring it out, cut the needle, make your orders knot and slide it back in. So that was excellent. You can stop sharing now.